We're going to talk about the influence and the power of Pulp Fiction. I'm Elvis Mitchell, and to my left... I'm Scott Fondas. Stephanie Zaharik. Tim Lucas. And Andy Klein. Scott, where did you first see Pulp Fiction? If I'm not mistaken, I saw Pulp Fiction uh, at uh, my local movie theater in Tampa, Florida, when I was in high school and, and uh, was starting to review movies in my high school newspaper and uh, so you reviewed it and also on a, a public access TV program so I did review Pulp Fiction that would be the first movie of of Quentin's that I actually reviewed in in some format and um, I, I mean I think the difference from Reservoir Dogs to Pulp Fiction is uh, you know you go from a, a, an extremely promising film to a film where you already feel really from the from the opening titles that you're, you know, in the, in the hands of a, of a true master. Everything in Pulp Fiction, from the font of the titles to the radio changing stations under the credits. Right from the beginning, that movie just grabs you and it says, this is something to be reckoned with. This is the work of someone who is in complete command of every element on the screen. Stephanie? I wasn't crazy about it, and I have to say, even at this point, it is the most beautifully constructed movie that I really can't love all that much. Um, Whoa. Well, <laughs> Explicate Stephen Platt. It, there seemed to be a kind of smirkiness in the attitude, um, in his in his attitude toward the characters and toward the material that I just didn't respond you to. You felt that in the, in the opening scene in the diner between Amanda Plummer and, and, and Tim Roth, you felt that was smirky? Yeah, I did. Okay. I did. And, and I just, the whole thing felt a little, it felt too self-conscious to me. Um, I kind of felt that it was very well made, but th there was kind of a remoteness to it that I just didn't respond to. The remoteness that you didn't see in Reservoir Dogs even? Did I did see it there. That's one of the reasons I didn't like Reservoir Dogs. So they, they felt distant to you? They felt distant to Was there anything that you responded to that you ended up really liking in, in, in Pulp Fiction? Actually, there are several things I love the dance sequence and everything that leads up to it. it was a that scene is so beautifully shot. You get to see their whole bodies. I mean, I can't tell you how many movies made within the last 20 or 30 years where everything is like so chopped up. And it's like, no, I want to see the bodies move. There was this moment I was watching him. He just had a little thing where he like gets up on his toes. I was like, ouch, just has got to hurt, but it like looks so great, you know. So I mean, I can't say, oh, I hate everything about this movie. It's that is certainly not true. But um, I, I, I have to admit, I kind of cherry pick. I have like certain favorite parts, and of course, I shot Marvin in the face. I mean, how can you not love that, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, just so sentimental about Marvin being shot in the face. <laughs> uh, Tim? Uh, well, I, I actually saw Pulp Fiction for the first time on, on DVD, and one of the things I remember hearing at the time was that uh, Quentin was claiming that Mario Bava's Black Sabbath had been his inspiration for, for doing a kind of anthology uh, arrangement. And it's not really an anthology so much as it's, it's one sort of epic story that's... Just been shuffled. Sh lopped, lopped up and, uh, and shuffled in, in a different order to entice... Uh, the viewer, and watching it again, I, I, I keep noticing little things. Like like there there are continuities of of character, like between Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. In Pulp Fiction, John Travolta plays Vincent Vega, Vega. and the, uh, Michael Madsen plays Vic Vega in Reservoir Dogs. And so you're thinking, are these like brothers? You know what what's the story? Because they have the same hair even. And uh, actually, looking at the uh, at the deleted sequences in Reservoir Dogs, uh, the person that uh, Chris Penn is talking about, the person he was going to get, the medical advisor, is a nurse that he knows named Bonnie. <laughs> you know, so this sets you up for the Bonnie situation part in Pulp Fiction, and this is actually part of of a tradition that goes all the way through Pulp Fiction with with Sax Romer inventing Fu Manchu and carrying him over a series of novels. See, that's the comic book thing for me, too. There's yeah. that kind of continuity that comes from those things where they're, they're all part of the, instead of the Marvel Universe, it's the Tarantino Universe. Yeah, exactly. Andy? Red Apple Cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I first saw it at uh, the first big press screening in L.A. And uh, having, you know, I had really liked Reservoir Dogs. It was on my top ten list, but I didn't say this is 
the greatest film of the last 10 years or anything like that. With Pulp Fiction, I really did feel that way. I thought, I, I mean, unlike Stephanie, I really loved it from the start. I mean, to me, it was like eating, you know, rich ice cream. Every moment was either funny or something really interesting was going on on screen. I, it just, I'm not sure that there's a slow moment in the film. Even Christopher Walken doing a monologue. And theoretically, that should have slowed things down, but it doesn't. Uh, certainly, I was with a good audience, which helped. The person in front of me laughed so hard that the seat broke, <laughs> and they had to go, go sit someplace else. Uh, structurally, there's this debt to The Killing, the Kubrick mm -hmm. film, which is a great movie. Traditionally, if you're going to have a flashback, there'll be somebody sitting there about to tell a story, and their face will go hazy, that sort of thing. Here in The Killing, it was just for the sake of doing it, and how that uh, managed to create the suspense in a different way. The same is, is true here. I know people who said, uh, well, it's all out of order for no reason, which seemed really silly to me because a lot of the pleasure is the way things are, are doled out to you and the order in which you get them. One of the things that made this movie feel more real to me than, than, than Reservoir Dogs, I sort of felt like they were kind of wearing costumes. And this felt the way people dress. I mean, that outfit that Uma Thurman wears, just the, the leggings and the big white shirt. That's water what, bell bottoms. Yes, it, that's, yeah. that's what somebody would wear. These felt like real clothes to me. That and the Samuel L. Jackson Jerry Curl, which is the most <laughs> oh, that, wonderful thing in the history of movies. <laughs> I mean, you see somebody with a Jerry Curl in 1994 when even bus drivers and 7-Eleven clerks no longer had Jerry Curls was a real statement about this, who this guy was. It also explained why he's wearing a black suit, so you wouldn't. Well, but but I I would say the black suits are one respect in which I think the costumes aren't exactly you know naturalistic or everyday kind of out of the closet sort of things. Well, I mean, but, I think no, there's a, the thing is almost everybody has a black suit. Yeah, and you know? and, 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 and Uma Thurman rumpled, is very though, stylized in her way. I mean, I think everybody in the movie kind of imagines themselves in a movie. I mean, before Vincent and Jules go into that apartment, uh, one of them They're getting says, in character. Yeah, let's get in a character. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a telling thing because I think more and more, uh, you know, as, as he's gone along, you know, it's not just that Quentin references movies in his movies, it's that the characters have this heightened awareness of pop culture. But it's still I think the they way the people, imagine themselves going in and out But I think the way, the way those people would do that, those guys would imagine this is the way thugs would dress. Exactly. Because yeah. again, you know, if you were really that conscious of it, you wouldn't have a jerry curl in 1994. I cannot emphasize this <laughs> enough. Come on, come on, come on. Get him up there a little bit. Hey, Vincent, get out of my head. Come on, come on. Even the way after they get hosed down, do you notice he kind of plays with it? This Yes. Got to make sure that it's, you know, I get But he, he tenses up, he's thinking, what's going to happen to my activator <laughs> if the, they put this water in my hair? You know, Quentin tells a story about the jerry curl that, that it was an accident, really, that he asked for an Afro wig and uh, the costume or the hair makeup person, person the, the hair person didn't know the difference and brought the jerry curl. And, and, and Sam demanded just, that he keep it. Yeah. Well, no, yeah, I, no, no, no. But, but it's, finish for me, the story. No, I, I just felt like it. And seeing it where I saw it, I've, I was the only person insanely moved to laughter by it because <laughs> it was just such an honest thing. Again, it felt like that kind of, it, it felt, this one felt more real to me than Reservoir Dogs. And that's why I was wondering where you said you thought it felt kind of smirky to you. And did it not feel honest at all? It didn't feel, I, I, when you say it felt honest, I, I understand exactly what you're saying in terms of, you know, those details. And I just, it, still feels smart alecky to me like I, I now I kind of I love the braggadocio of the filmmaking and I love the structure you know when Vincent dies what like midway through and then you know he comes back I was like hey wait a minute he's dead you can't bring it that's not playing by the rules you know and then I was like oh, that's the way it's supposed to be you know and and so I love that. I mean, I love when, when that sort of thing happens. But there's just something a little, it just feels very self-conscious to me. Um, I know a lot of younger critics who said, my God, this is a revelation. This is going to change filmmaking. And actually, it did change filmmaking, although <laughs> I wish. Now, here's the other thing. Why on earth do we have so many people influenced by Quentin Tarantino's movies as they should be influenced? And yet, 
they're not looking at Howard Hawks or Brian De Palma or they they don't realize like how important the whole history of filmmaking is, which is one thing that he recognizes, even in the movies I don't like, you know. So he's done all of his homework. But it's, but it's not just movies, and it's that the movie itself makes an entrance this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the credits in black against that screen, it's just sort of saying, I'm making a movie this time with movie stars and, and with people who should be movie stars. You know, the filmmaking definitely shows off, but it doesn't show off in the way of like a Scorsese film with really elaborate tracking shots or, or Brian De Palma, you know, a, a very ostentatious kind of stylistic gestures. To me, it is more in, you know, what people wear, how they walk, how they talk, you know, these kind of, the way that, that, that you know, this sort of Tarantino universe is permeating every corner of the, of the frame because the shots themselves and the lighting and that kind of thing is actually really very, very simple, very elegant, very not calling attention to itself. And I think, you know, Jackie Brown is very much like that also. And then, you know, when you go into the Kill Bill movies, you have a completely mm -hmm. different aesthetic. Also, wanting to film in parts of Los Angeles and, and South Bay that are like unchanged by time, kind of capturing the Southern California of his own youth in a way. Sure, I mean, even Butch's apartment, he sneaks back in and he puts the Ralph Brand Pop-Tart <laughs> Yeah. The toaster. And yeah. that really yeah. felt to me like a movie that was broadcasting that was about Southern California, but not West LA, not no. Santa Monica, no. not the spacious part, the, but the place Never where you Never west of the 405, for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but also, I understand what you talk about when you say the realism of the film, like in terms of relationships and things like that. But to me, the whole the whole feel of the film is very is very surreal or, or, or a heightened realism. It's like the scene in the cab, you know, with, with this incredible black and white rear projection, which you see a couple of times in the movie when people are driving. I think there's a juxtaposition of that. Yeah. I mean, going from the real to, because that moment in the cab is so incredibly surreal. Yeah. I mean, there are enough real moments in it uh, to go along with the fact that it is epic. I mean, it's, it's real, but it's not small. I mean, it's, 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 in a lot of ways, it's very intimate, but there's a grandeur to it. That thing that I think people imitate him just to they can't bring that kind of size to the filmmaking. Mm. It feels like they get the small details and they worry about those, but there's no vision. I mean, there's no point of view there. And if you can't create characters, then you don't have points of view. And they haven't done their homework. I mean, Quentin, he, he, he knows the history of cinema, you know, probably as well as any filmmaker since Godard. If you look at the movie, too, they don't think it happens in Reservoir Dogs, but in this one, you get visual references to other movies. And I'm thinking specifically of, of Kiss Me Deadly with the, the suitcase which opens, you never see the contents, but it seems to be gold. Some sort of honey-colored light seems to bathe people when they look inside this. And also when Marcellus is introduced, you never see his face during the whole scene. And it just holds on Bruce Willis listening, which is a pretty audacious cinematic feat because it's like what you don't see, you're left to imagine and it becomes much more imposing. But yes. that, that's what you could really feel, a sort of sense of, of reality and theatricality simultaneously, that I think is really a big part of the allure of the way he's able to sort of balance all of this stuff. One of the great things about the, the hypodermic scene is the fact that he's basically crashed his car into the front of the house <laughs> and <laughs> taken out a nativity scene in, it, in, in front of the house. And so you know this is drawing attention to this very private thing that's going on in the house. And actually my, my favorite line of dialogue in the movie happens during that scene when, when they're talking about the preparation for the shot and Eric still says, I'm kind of curious about that myself. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> deflating thing. And if he, did, if he didn't say that, my, my heart might have burst, you know, from suspense in that scene. It's, it's just a great deflator. Although when she wakes up, it's, to me, one of the funniest things in the movie. It's just yeah. such a precise bit of mm -hmm. comic timing, that needle going in and her aghast, you know, rejuvenation. It's, just it's, brings up and spirals It's, it's back. really, it's just perfectly done. Say something. Something? <laughs> that was fucking trippy. <laughs> For me, Pulp Fiction is the one that sort of dances gracefully between all these different areas. It's 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 realistic and it's surrealistic and it's it's 
it's sort of intimate, but it's it's really got this amazing sort of emotional grandeur, and it's it's as much a piece. In fact, I think more a piece of emotional storytelling than narrative storytelling, because each of those stories, those characters, is completed, and that's why the shuffling works so ingeniously. Because you might not have the patience to see these things played out in order, but seeing each thing sort of like worked out, getting bits and pieces of it, and then makes it all the more satisfying. I just think that. The, all those imitations of it don't understand that not only do you have to have older actors in it, but you also have to let people finish out their storylines and be true to these characters and play off these romances. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking that the real sex scene in this film is the scene where he shoots up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the most romantic depiction mm -hmm. of, of heroin addiction I've ever seen. It's just unabashedly romantic. It's interesting that in a lot of the films you get these beautiful relationships between two people that don't connect sexually, but then you get a scene like this, which is a big payoff, and when you see Vincent in the car with the black and white rear screen projection, you know, that's like having the cigarette after sex. He's just going down the highway. And the car's also kind of the girl for him to remember how he talks about that car and caresses yeah. the car and the whole speech yeah. about the car being keyed. Mm hmm Right. Butch. Butch keyed the car. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you think I, so? I, I, once during a Q&A with Quentin, I asked him to pin that one down because Travolta has just insulted him in the bar. You looking at something, friend? You ain't my friend, Palooka. And he goes out and keys the car. We just don't see it. Is that why there's that sort of playing with the Zed's keys at the end? Because is that getting back to the keys, too? Could be. This is getting horribly recognized. You know, there, isn't there's it? some very delicate things in there. I mean, a lot was written about the introduction of Mia Wallace in the film with the focus on her feet. But we've only heard about her before in relation to the foot massage story. Mm -hmm. So that's the way to introduce her. You know, this is, this is what the Samoan was thrown out the window for. <laughs> <laughs> Those feet, which become very important in Kill Bill. Yes, they do. This, this is all, again, it's the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. Tales of Suspense, 166, 166 all these things mm -hmm. connect. I mean, you, you see the films, they, there's there all these things that sort of pay off for the devoted viewer. And he also taps into, as a filmmaker, a whole strata of films that most film directors mm -hmm. don't consciously channel uh, when they're designing a piece of work. So he, will, he will go into uh, Enzo Castellari and Sergio Corbucci, you know, not just going to Hawks, you know, or, or Robert Aldrich. He, he digs for buried treasure. What do you guys feel like it stands now, I mean, given the kind of approbation it got at that moment? It seems to me that the only way in which the reputation has changed is that it's, it's become part of the fabric now in a way that not more than most films get to be. You know, look, Casablanca becomes part of the fabric of the culture and everything refers to it. How many lines in Pulp Fiction have you heard people quote, you know, 5,000 times? Uh, it, it's it's almost sort of a, a taken for not taken for granted, but it's just it's part well, it kind of, of is because it, it, you don't think about the origin of the quotes anymore. It just they're part mm -hmm. of the conversation now. That way, you were saying. No, I think it's That's it's like, hard to think of a movie from the '90s that has contributed more sort of instantly recognizable lines or images to you know the sort of the the pop yeah. culture discourse. When you permeate culture like that, when people get together and they swap lines from a movie that they love, it becomes more than just about the movie. It becomes something that people remember about times when they were together with their friends mm -hmm. and experiences that they shared. Uh, so it becomes bigger than the movie. The other thing, too, is people feel very protective of Pulp Fiction as if it were a shared secret. And this was a big movie. I mean, it was a big hit. But the way people talk about it, they're like, no, this belongs to me, this belongs to us, which is interesting, you know, because sometimes people feel that way about little small, you know, cult films. They feel like this really needs to be protected, but fiction is like, sort of is, is in this bubble of like. I think it's, it's part of that, that's that sense of authorship that comes from him, that people really feel like these movies are their connection to him and because he writes them and directs them and, and his sensibility is so much a part of them. He doesn't collaborate in that way where and he's not promiscuous about collaboration either I mean there's that, that sense of things running through and I feel like for a lot of people that sort of cult sense you're talking about as a movie feels like it does feel like again both big and intimate at the same time and because it, it, it's, it satisfies a number of people in so many ways 
that they still feel that, that sense of possessiveness about it. And I think that maybe extends to a lot of his films in general, though. Uh, another thing to remember about Pulp Fiction is that it was made for $8 million and it grossed over $100 million here plus a ton around the world. And it was the, actually the first indie film to break the $100 million barrier. And really the film that made Miramax into a, a box office power, a film that mm -hmm. was basically something they picked up from another studio, but they really embraced him and it began Miramax as the way we, we now think of it still, even all these years later.